Um, so it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day, Professor Bill Dali from Stanford. Um, Bill is a Willard R. and Ines Bell Professor of Engineering and the Chair of the CS Department at Stanford University. Um, he and his research group uh, have developed system architecture, network architecture, high-speed signaling, routing, and synchronization technology. And most of this can be found in most large Android computers today. Um, for his contribution to computer architecture and interconnection networks, Bill has received numerous honors including the IEEE Seymour Cray Award and the ACM Maurice Wilkes Award. And he has published over 170 papers and is an author of two textbooks, Digital System Engineering and Principles and Practices of Interconnection Networks. Uh, aside from academia, Bill has also played key roles or co-founded several companies such as Radio Systems, Hardware Processor Link, and also Reaching Systems. And thankfully, with so much going on, he still manages to find one-on-one -on -one time for most of the best to meet. This talk is going to be broadcast on Google Video, so please ask appropriate questions, and if you have sensitive questions, please go to the end. So without much ado, um, well, thanks, Arjun. Um, it's a pleasure being here. Hopefully, uh, both mics are live. Clearly, one is. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, talk to you a little bit about um, high rate interconnection networks. Um, here's sort of the outline of what we're going to talk about today. But before I dive into that, um, let me start with a brief introduction, since unlike Arjun, who's actually one of my former PhD students, uh, many of you may not know sort of who I am or, or what my research group does. Um, when Arjun said, can you come to Google and give a talk on what your research is, I said, well, I could, but I can't give one talk on it. Which one do you want? And I gave him this menu, and he ordered the bottom entree. Um, so there's, there's other things we do. We do a lot of work. Um, um, the way I like to describe it is my research group works at the extremes of computer architecture. We work on the architecture of very large supercomputers and very demanding applications for very low power embedded processors. Um, so for our example, our efficient embedded computing project is aimed at being able to develop programmable hardware, which is competitive um, with hardwired ASICs for applications like cell phone modems, um, Wi-Fi modems, digital TV display processors, and things of that nature. Um, we also are doing a lot of work on uh, bioinformatics architectures where the uh, applications have uh, computing requirements that are different enough that actually FPGAs give big um, advances in, in performance by being able to match the computation. Um, we're doing a bunch of work on supercomputing, both at the language level. We've developed a language called Sequoia um, which explicitly manages storage um, in, in a hierarchical machine. We've targeted that both to our own Merrimack streaming supercomputer and to the IBM cell, um, as well as to clusters of workstations. Um, and for interconnection networks at the embedded side, we're doing a lot of work on on-chip networks. You know, now that people are putting multiple cores on a chip, actually a lot of thought needs to go into the networks to tie them together, and it's a very different problem uh, than building system area networks. What I'm going to talk about today is our work um, largely in collaboration with Cray, um, on interconnection networks for supercomputers. Um, uh, my group has been working on interconnection networks um, uh, for a long time, since uh, you know, the Mars router that's shown here that I built at Bell Labs in 84. I built the Taurus routing chip at Caltech in 85. Um, a bunch of routers built at MIT. And we also built systems around these routers. Um, our MDP chip, which actually had a, had a 3D Taurus router on it, went into the J machine. Um, a, a very um, close router to the J machine router was used in the Cray T3D, but re-implemented in uh, ECL gate arrays. Um, our map chip shown there actually has a, uh, um, a Taurus router on it as well. And the Imagine chip has um, routing on it also. Um, and these have found their way out into a bunch of different um, commercial systems in one way or another. Um, there's a lot of uh, distinguished alumni from the group. This is actually just the academic ones. I had this slide around. Um, there's a bunch in industry as well. Um, and from the Shameless Commerce Division of uh, our, our group, you should uh, talk to Larry Page and have him buy every Google employee a copy of both of these books. They're, uh, they're really valuable. One basically sort of says everything you need to know about how to build networks. The other one basically says everything you need to know about how to you know, sort of do the electrical engineering of big systems. Um, so let me dive then in, into the real meat of this talk um, with the introduction done. Um, and uh, it's interesting, in, in the um, late 80s, I wrote a series of papers explaining to people that they shouldn't build hypercube networks. They should build you know, relatively low dimensional, which also implies low radix, um, torus or mesh networks for their machines. And at the time, that was the right answer. Um, but you know, time changes, and one of the things that, that changes, and a lot of people don't realize this, is that network routers are on very much the same kind of a growth curve 
as processors are in terms of Moore's law. Um, and here's um, one way I like to refer to that, that curve, which shows, um, I know he said I'm supposed to use the mouse arrow, but it's hard to do that when I'm over here. Is this the uh, laser? I think this laser works. I think the batteries are dead. Um, in any case, this shows, um, as a function of calendar year, the bandwidth off of a router, router chip. I've sort of put little boxes around the routers that I've had a hand in designing, starting with the Taurus routing chip um, down here. And what you can see is that you know, um, over the decade, from sort of 1990 to 2000, um, there were more than two orders of magnitude increase in the bandwidth off a router. At the same time, the packets that you're sending didn't really increase in length very much. And um, the, the latency through the router um, you know, actually went down because the, uh, you know, the devices you were building them out have got faster, even though you had a few more pipeline stages. Um, so when you have this increase in bandwidth, um, think if you have a router with a certain number of ports, you get an increase in bandwidth. You can either um, you know, put a certain number of ports on that router. So if I take my bandwidth and I double it, I could make those ports all twice as wide. Right? But at some point in time, there's big diminishing returns to basically building, you know, say, a router with four ports, which would be more than enough um, to build a 3D interconnect. Um, oh, how it works? Aha. Uh, which would be more than enough to build a 3D interconnect. Um, I eventually get my ports wide enough that I can put a packet broadside into them. It doesn't make sense to, to make them any wider than that. In fact, it doesn't make sense even before you reach that point. Because the alternative, as I get more bandwidth on my chip, is I can have more ports of the same bandwidth. And then the question is, you know, which is, is more effective? And this is a question that, that can be answered quite um, precisely by comparing the resulting cost and latency of the networks that are realized um, with, with high, high radix links and low radix links. Um, now, the cost is absolutely a no-brainer, because the higher radix router you build, the fewer hops you need to deliver a packet, and the lower cost the network's going to be, because the network cost uh, goes almost directly with the number of hops. The latency is, is a little bit more difficult uh, a question um, because latency has two components to it. Here's the equation for latency, which of course you can find in, in the book I showed earlier, um, which has a component due to the number of hops times the delay through a router, uh, plus the length of the packet over the bandwidth of, of the, uh, the link you're traversing. We refer to this part of the latency as, as header latency, the time for the first bit of the packet to get to the destination. And this uh, part of latency is serialization latency, the time for the rest of the packet to catch up. Um, and if we sort of express these as a function of the radix of our router k, we'll see that as we increase k, the header latency goes down. We, it takes fewer hops because we're using a higher base logarithm to decide how many hops we need. Um, and our um, uh, serialization latency goes up because as we make higher radix, the channels get skinnier and we've got a squeeze our packet um, over that. Um, the overall bandwidth per port, by the way, in, into our machine remains unchanged because we can apply a technique called channel slicing, that if you need a certain amount of bandwidth and you slice your channels narrower than that, you simply then start commutating your traffic over a number of skinny ports. Um, so this, this is completely independent of the terminal bandwidth you want out of, out of the network. Um, well, here's what happens to latency, and I've plotted um, both the bandwidth point for 2003 and, and 2010 technology. Um, and what you see happens is, um, as you increase radix, um, you basically reduce header latency a lot here, and then serialization latency goes up. Although by 2010, we have enough bandwidth that you know, the header latency doesn't go up until fairly far out there. So this is sort of the regime of header latency. This is the regime um, where serialization latency is dominating. In this case, the optimal radix is about 40 uh, for 2003 technology. Um, for 2010 technology, it's going to be about 128. Um, ports per router. Yeah, Waldemar. Yeah, so I, they're actually, if you look at the detailed version of that equation, um, to back up through all this animation, the detailed version of this equation in the book, there's actually another term, which is the time of flight over the wires. Um, and that term remains relatively constant, um, regardless of which alternative you, you pursue. There's small differences, but they're not big ones. So I basically, to, to make this talk fit into an hour, didn't go into that um, level of detail. But that, that's a good question. Um, so back, back to here. Um, it turns out that if you decide you want to optimize latency, um, you can take this latency equation. Um, differentiate it, set that equal to zero, and solve for the value of k. 
um, that gives you the optimum latency. And in fact, that optimal latency happens um, when um, this is true. And we refer to, to this term as the aspect ratio of the network, because in, in many ways it, it's related um, to the ratio of bandwidth, the, the overall bandwidth you have on the router, to the length of the packet. You can think of that ratio as being the aspect ratio you have to deal with um, for a network. And if you plot aspect ratio um, on one axis and optimal radix on the other axis, um, you'll basically see that, that it's a you know, monotonically increasing function. And over time, you move up the aspect ratio curve. You also move up the radix curve. So the, the bottom line to take away from this is that um, you know, we've now moved into a regime where having a, a radix of 6, for example, which is a radix required to build a three-dimensional torus network, um, is very suboptimal to give you much higher cost, much higher latency um, than a radix today, um, which is probably you know, somewhere in the range of 64 to 128, which will give you the optimal um, latency and, and cost uh, to build an interconnection network. So hopefully you, uh, you buy into that. Let me now talk about the problems that that creates. So if you look at sort of a typical uh, router, um, and we actually in our, in our textbook walk through a typical what we call virtual channel router, and you look at the you know, anatomy of it, um, you know, packets come in to input controllers, which are basically responsible for managing a bunch of queues. And in a virtual channel router, these queues are partitioned by virtual channels um, to cause non-interference between different types of, of traffic. That all scales just fine, um, right? Because as you add more ports to the router, the number of input controllers grows linearly. And actually, it turns out a lot of the complexity of the input controller is proportional to its bandwidth. Um, that drives the bandwidth you need for the memories and the amount of storage capacity you need in these memories. And that really doesn't matter whether you have wide channels or, or more skinny channels. You need you have the same amount of bandwidth. You need the same amount of, of logic. So the input controller scale just fine. Um, you then take your packet and you do some kind of a routing computation. You decide, where is my packet going? And in particular, which output port of this router do I want to use? That scales linearly as well. You basically need to, that's again, basically is a function of the bandwidth of the router. That determines how many routing decisions you need per unit time. And you can scale that linearly um, across the input ports. Um, for simple routing decisions, we tend to duplicate that routing logic um, in every input controller. Um, the next thing that happens doesn't scale so well. It's you have to allocate a virtual channel on your selected output port for your packet. And it turns out that these allocators grow quadratically because they have to take bids from every input port for every output port. So both the state that they maintain is quadratic. It goes by the number of input ports times the number of output ports. And the logic is quadratic. Um, after you've allocated your virtual channel, you then have to allocate the switch. This is also a function that grows quadratically with the number of ports. Um, and so the switch allocators that work just fine with six port Taurus routers um, are infeasible to build with 128 port um, high radix routers. Um, finally, you go through the switch, and building a switch is building a switch. There's not, not a lot um, to do there. But we'll see in a minute, actually, what we do with that switch can make the allocation problems um, that I just mentioned a lot easier, a lot harder. So those are really the problem areas, the, the virtual channel allocator and the switch allocator. Um, so to um, baseline things, we decided to start out and look at what happens if we just build a straight virtual channel router um, and scale it to high radix. Um, for a low radix network, um, this is um, the, the characteristic latency throughput curve. And, and what you see is, um, as we offer the load to the network, we saturate at you know, just under 60% capacity. And this is due to head-of-line blocking in the crossbar switch. This is a very well-understood phenomena. As you increase the radix, the problem gets worse. Because if you just work the statistics out, um, the probability of, of blockage due to this effect goes up um, with radix. Um, moreover, you see that we're leaving a lot of um, bandwidth on the floor here. And for low radix routers, the technique that was used to deal with this uh, was simply to over-provision the switch. You say, OK, I can only run my switch to about 50% capacity. I'll provision my switch 2x or 3x the bandwidth of the ports, and um, that'll be fine. I won't, I won't keep my ports idle. And that was a reasonable thing to do, um, and actually still is a reasonable thing to do, because the expensive um, resource in these routers are, are the links. Uh, and your, your job is to make the links be busy as much as possible. Um, and not to idle an expensive link because it's waiting on an inexpensive switch. So over-provision the, the, the switch, have it be idle some of the time, keep the links busy all the time. Um, so it turns out that um, as you build really big switches, what you'd like to do is, is not do that because the switches start consuming more die area. Um, you don't want to have to over-provision them so much. The question is, can we you know, get better performance out of this? And at the same time, can we do that in a way that makes our allocation function 
a lot simpler? And, and the simple answer to that is, is yes. Um, I need to just get this to step on to the next one. Um, here's our baseline router, where basic, our baseline switch, where we basically just have all the input ports um, in a cross point switch with all the output ports. The way to get rid of the header line blocking problem is to separate the queuing up. And so what we'd like to do is put queuing at the cross points of our switch. So basically, if I have a packet coming in on an input um, and it loses the arbitration for an output, I haven't wasted the bandwidth of that input port, that cycle. Instead, I can drop it in um, a packet buffer and retry the allocation of the output on the next cycle. Because remember, these, the packets that come in here actually have to win two, two arbitrations to get to the output. They have to compete among all the input packets uh, across the virtual channels on this input port to get access to the input of the switch. And then once they've got access to the input of the switch, they have to compete with anybody else who wants the same output to get access to the output of the switch. And it's collisions in, in that second arbitration that led the performance to saturate at somewhere around 50% capacity um, if you don't have any queuing. If I do have queuing, every time I get an input, I make forward progress. Um, I, don't, I don't even arbitrate for the switch unless my virtual channel has a slot free in this intermediate buffer. And it decouples those two allocations um, so that I can wind up getting very close to 100% throughput. And in fact, um, here I've added a curve to the previous graph. Um, this was the low radix router. Um, this was the high radix router. This is with cross point buffering. And what you see is that you can actually run this thing out to 100% capacity. And it's giving you very much the, uh, the delay of an ideal queuing system, which is what it should do. Um, the, um, the problem with this is that it's prohibitively expensive to build that. The number of buffers you need in that switch um, goes quadratically with the number of ports. Um, in fact, it's the number of input ports times the number of output ports times the number of virtual channels times enough buffer space to cover a round trip delay over a link. Um, and so in fact, what you see is that um, you know, compared uh, to the wire area of the switch, basically your buffering is sort of free up to the wire area of the switch because you can sneak these buffers in underneath the cross point wiring. Um, compared to the wire area of the switch, somewhere around you know, 50 or so, uh, the buffer area dominates. Not at 128 where we want to build these, um, it starts taking up too much area and we can't economically build a switch of that variety. Um, so how do we fix this problem? Um, what we do is we add a third choice to our menu of, of switch organizations. And this one is what we call a hierarchical crossbar. We take our large switch that we want to build, say it's 100, well, let's say it's 64 ports, because that divides you. We take our 64 port switch, and we divide our inputs up into groups of eight, and our outputs up into groups of eight. And for each group of inputs and group of outputs, we put a small switch down. And this switch has no um, uh, queuing in it, but we put queues at the inputs and outputs of this small switch. So now we've also decoupled our, our problem. When an input packet comes in, it competes among its virtual channels um, for uh, competition to go across one of these links. When it wins, it's guaranteed to land in this buffer. It doesn't have to compete for that link again. Um, it then competes uh, for this switch. And if it wins that switch, it drops into one of these output buffers. And it then competes among the other switches in the column for um, access to the column and output um, to the link. And this has actually done two good things for us. One is it's actually dramatically reduced um, the amount of buffering required and hence the cost of building this. Um, the other thing that it's done is it's decomposed our allocation problem from one big 64-way allocation problem into several smaller eight-way allocation problems. By, by breaking down our allocation into selecting a subswitch and then selecting a port of the subswitch and selecting um, the output, we, we can now build sort of eight, eight at a time um, allocators that actually are feasible with the techniques we know, which we can run in one cycle and, and not uh, lengthen the pipeline of our router too much. Um, so the performance of this, um, oops, what happened here? I wanted this slide. Why am I not getting a graph? Well, my, my, my display shows a nice graph here, um, which you're not going to see, and I'm not going to try to debug this now. Um, but for whatever weird Microsoft reason you're not seeing it, um, this basically shows that um, the hierarchical network matches on uniform traffic, um, matches the performance of the um, cross-point buffered network. It turns out that things are not quite so good on worst case traffic. Um, so this is a fully buffered um, network, the network that basically builds one big cross-point switch with queues at every cross-point. Then these are different ways, this is for Radix 64, different, different ways of factoring it. And this is the baseline switch with no buffering. 
Um, now, with, with uniform random traffic, basically the, um, the packets coming in at an input are evenly distributed over the eight subswitches in a row, say for the subswitch eight line here. Um, and therefore, um, the load is, is uniformly distributed, everything works well. Um, the worst case traffic basically concentrates all of the traffic from a group of eight inputs onto a single group of eight outputs. And what it does then is it basically pushes each of those individual subswitches to a point um, where it winds up seeing the head of line blocking problems that we were seeing with the original switch. Um, the good news is that this almost never happens. The, the, the worst case traffic patterns that cause this um, are extremely unlikely um, in practice. And so in fact, we've gone ahead and built switches um, doing this, and almost all the time, the performance on them is indistinguishable um, from the performance of, of the fully buffered switch, and they're a small fraction of the cost to build. Um, what's, what's even better, um, you, you, even though I showed before that sort of the, uh, um, the low radix routers you know, looked like they had better performance because of less head of line blocking, the problem is that that's less head of line blocking per hop of the network. And with the low radix routers, you have more hops and so, in fact, over the network, they wind up having substantially lower performance. They have both higher latency um, because they take more hops. Their hop count part of the latency is actually dramatically higher. Here, there's a lot of serialization latency. And they have um, you know, lower saturation throughput because they're having more opportunities um, to run into those um, blocking problems. So high radix is, is a win all around. So um, let me now talk about topology. So when we first... Um, you know, came to this realization, and it was actually a surprise to me. We were working the numbers, and I was fully expecting to find that Taurus networks were yet again the right answer. But just for thoroughness, we popped in, you know, clone networks as well, and we're running the numbers, and the numbers popped out and showed me that I was wrong, that the Taurus networks were not the right answer, that the clone networks worked, and then we sort of, you know, teased that apart and came up with this notion of aspect ratio, and, and we're able to show that these high radix networks were optimal. Our initial thought was we would do clone networks, since that was the analysis we were doing. Um, to do this. Now the problem with a, uh, a clone network, especially when you're building a big network, which is filling a large machine room or even several machine rooms, is that the expensive things are the links. And in a clone network, you sort of have twice as many links as you would think you would need. Because uh, the way to think about it is you sort of in a, a clone network is a butterfly folded back on itself. I probably should have put an illustration of one of these in here. You basically um, traverse one set of links up to a middle stage. Then you traverse another set of links back from that middle stage to your endpoint. Um, and so if you were to compare it to a butterfly network, you're, you're traversing twice as many links as you know, the theoretical minimum that you would need to dis discriminate against um, N endpoints. Now, the reason you don't use a butterfly is what? That has a minimum diameter. Why don't I just use a butterfly to wire my networks up? Is it blocking? That's right, it's blocking. It's a blocking network. Um, many people tried this on um, building parallel computers in, in the 1980s. BBN in particular had a machine called the BBN Butterfly. And what they found is that there were traffic patterns that brought the machine to its knees. And the reason is that there's no path diversity in a butterfly network. There's exactly one route from every input to every output in a butterfly network. And in fact, an adversarial traffic pattern will line up those routes in such a way that you get congestion on an intermediate link of the network that brings the network down to sort of a square root of its um, capacity. So if you have, you know, a you know, 1,024 node network, you'd be down to 1 32nd of the capacity of the butterfly on worst case traffic patterns. Um, so um, our, our view on topology is basically, here's a sort of our constraints. Uh, we wanted to get, um, you know, the lowest possible hop count, and that's the hop count for a butterfly. The hop count for a clo is twice that. And we'd like to have good performance on both benign and adversarial traffic patterns. So since we have to handle um, adversarial traffic patterns that rules out the butterfly network. Um, they have no path diversity. We can't handle these well. But the clone networks um, have twice this minimum uh, bandwidth. If we fold the clone networks, we can exploit some locality because you don't have to route all the way up to the middle switch stage. You only have to route up to a common ancestor. The thinking machine CM5 used um, a similar thing in their, in their uh, fat tree networks. Um, we also looked at these. There's a property of networks called Cayley graphs that keep mathematicians employed. Um, they're horrendously difficult to route in because they're kind of a bizarre topology. They're not easy to reason about um, like, a, uh, like a clo. So we were playing around with this, and I was very, particularly in the context of the Cray machines, I was looking at the cost of these machines, and the costs were dominated by the optical links in the machine. And I just couldn't help but think, gee, we take these packets, and we send them over one optical link from the cabinet that their source processor is in, 
to the central cabinet that, that's basically full of routers. And then we send it over another optical link from that router cabinet down to the cabinet that the destination processor is in. We could cut our you know, optical link cost in half if we just threw away one of those optical links and connected the source cabinet directly to the destination cabinet. Um, and so um, we played around with these ideas for a little while. Of course, we don't have enough router ports to connect all the source cabinets to all the destination cabinets. So how do you do this? We came up with this notion of a topology we call the flattened butterfly um, because this is sort of the way we derived it. Think of this as a butterfly that, that got rear-ended and sort of got smooshed down upon itself. Here I've drawn sort of a 16 um, port Radix 2 butterfly, which you normally think of as having four ranks of switches and three ranks of wiring between those switches. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take all four of the switches in each of these rows, and we're going to combine them in a single router chip. What this means is that all of the um, connections within the row, basically half the connections out of each router, go away. They're now internal connections in that router. And all the connections to other rows, the uh, red line shown here, are the connections out of this router to other routers that, that represent those other rows. Now, you know, have I, you know, I already said that a butterfly is a bad interconnection network because it has no path diversity. Have I just gotten myself back in the same you know, boat as, as the butterfly network um, by flattening it? And the answer is no. By flattening it, I now have the ability um, to traverse these dimensions in any order and to traverse some dimensions more than once. Um, so this actually gives me complete path diversity. In fact, I can emulate a clone network on the flattened butterfly by traversing each, each dimension exactly twice, once on the way up and once on the way back down. But I don't have to. By flattening it, um, I now have the ability to emulate a CLO and get exactly the same uh, performance as a CLO, and I need that non-blocking performance. But if I have a benign traffic pattern, I can choose to go directly to my destination or to take a minimal path um, to my destination. So I'll talk a little bit about how we route this um, later, but, but the, the nice thing is now that by flattening the butterfly, I've eliminated the, the objectionable characteristic of the butterfly, its lack of path diversity, and I've retained its uh, desirable characteristic, which is um, the minimal, the theoretically minimal distance um, between ports. So how do you package this? Um, this sort of serves a sketch of how to package these. Um, so so there's, four, there's four ranks of switches um, in the butterfly. Now, one thing that we do lose here is, is that our effective radix goes down because I'm packing four ranks of switches into one high radix switch. So if I have, for example, a radix 64 switch, um, I'm not going to be able to pack radix 64 in each stage of the butterfly. I have to do a quarter of that. So the first stage, I'll take 16 processors, connect them into the router. I'll then take 16 of those routers, and I will connect them together um, with um, a quarter of the lines out of the router. So I actually need only 15 links um, to do this. I'll then take 15 links, um, and I'll connect them to other, um, we'll call this dimension one. That was sort of the first inter-router uh, routing in my butterfly network. I'll take another 15 links to connect them to 15 other cabinets in this dimension, and another 15 links to connect them to 15 other cabinets in that dimension. If you look at this, um, if you're a bird flying above the machine room and you look at this, um, what you see is this. Dimension one, actually, dimension zero is the 16 processors into one router. Dimension one, which is 16 of those routers, is all in one of these cabinets. So there's 256 processors in each of the cabinets. Dimension two is along one uh, dimension of the machine room. Um, and dimension three is along the other dimension of, of the machine room. So if you, if you package it that way, and we also did similar packaging plans for competing networks which included the CLO and a hypercube. And we actually had a 3D torus in here too, but it was the most expensive by far. Um, and you compare them, um, what you see, and, and I, uh, um, if you look at our, uh, our paper on this, it actually goes into details about our cost model. We have a very detailed cost model, um, which captures the increasing cost as you go from a link on a board to a link over a backplane to an electrical link over a cable to an optical link over a fiber. Um, and it's got basically you know, cost as a function of distance and packaging level. Um, if you apply that cost model to this, what you see is you know, the, uh, the hypercube is absolutely the most expensive of these. The butterfly is absolutely the cheapest, but the flattened butterfly, this flattening, which reduces your effective radix, doesn't really cost you very much. There's a gap in here where, where it costs you something because you had to jump to one more stage earlier than the butterfly did but you still have that logarithmic performance and you only have one traversal of the network and it, it wins you fairly big. Um, now what does this do for traffic, um, for, for performance? So if I have uniform random traffic, 
um, and this basically is comparing um, a bunch of different routing algorithms, I can basically get you know, essentially 100% throughput out of the network. Um, running Valiant is, equ is the equivalent of emulating the clone network. I'm basically picking a random um, intermediate point, think of that as a random middle stage, routing to it, and then routing to my actual destination. Um, and so what this shows is that when I have benign traffic, um, I can do twice as well as the clone network um, in terms of performance delivered per unit cost of the network. And that's really because I'm traversing twice as many of these expensive links. Um, when I have worst case traffic, you'll notice um, the uh, axis has been changed. Um, I saturated around 50% because I really can't do much better uh, than emulating the clone network. And what I'll talk about next really is the difference between this line, which uses, um, basically it emulates the CLO um, in an adaptive way um, with these lines, which basically are, are variants on Valiant, picking a random middle stage and routing there. And then um, in the next little segment of this talk, I'll talk a little bit about why adaptive routing is just strictly better than oblivious routing um, for doing these things. And you really don't want to do this. Um, this is what happens if you do minimal routing. And minimal routing basically reduces you to the case um, as if you had a butterfly, right? If you had a butterfly network, you'd have no choice but to do middle, minimal routing. And there is only one minimal route. And the worst case traffic pattern is exactly that one um, that stresses that minimal route. It's basically where everybody in this cabinet decides to communicate only with that cabinet. You only have one link between those two cabinets. That link gets completely overflowed. The only way um, to get better performance is to actually send non-minimally to send to some other cabinet and then forward on to your destination cabinet. So that brings up the question of routing. Um, how do you route um, in these interconnection networks? And I should say that a lot of our understanding of, of routing is, is due to uh, Two, two students that are, are both, unfortunately, no longer in my group. The, the problem with students is by the time they get useful, um, they graduate. One is Arjun Singh, who's here at, at, at Google, who developed a lot of our theory of global adaptive routing, and Brian Tolles, uh, who's now at DE Shaw, who developed um, our theory of oblivious routing. Um, so there's two, there's two points that I want to get across about routing, and I'll, I'll try to do this by just showing a bunch of examples. Um, one that really was kind of an eye-opener to me is that uh, adaptive routing avoids this phenomenon we call transient load imbalance. Um, and this, this is a phenomenon where if you think about routing in a clone network, for example, if you route obliviously, if you randomly pick a middle stage of the network, um, you know that your traffic is going to be uniformly distributed because I have a uniform random function picking those middle stages. On average, every middle stage is going to get the same amount of traffic and everything should be fine. You shouldn't be able to beat that. But that assumes that you're integrating over enough time for the law of large numbers to work, right? In an instant, you know, if you have n nodes pick n middle stages, what is the expected value um, of the number of packets at the middle stage that receives the most packets will receive? Log it's log n. A simple application of, of uh, Sterling's formula will show you that. Um, and so because of that, in a transient, in the transient of that one round of sending messages, I have a load imbalance where one middle stage has, n has log n times as much traffic as the other middle stage, 1,024 nodes, I've got you know, 10 packets on one guy, and the average node has one packet. Um, so this transient load imbalance um, leads to greater latency um, for oblivious routing, where the adaptive routing avoids that. In adaptive routing, as I go up the CLO, I say, you know, who has bigger queues? Well, I'm not going to go there. I'll go here. And it winds up perfectly balancing, even over very short time intervals, the load on the middle stages and the load on the channels. Um, so that's the first observation. The next observation is really applying uh, some of the work that, that Arjun Singh did for his thesis uh, to these networks, is that if we have the flattened butterfly network, what we'd like to do is when we can get away with it, route it like a butterfly, take that minimal path, because that's cheap. But then when we can't get away with it, revert and route it like a clone network, take you know, a, a non-minimal path to spread the load over our network. And the question is, how do we decide when we can get away with the minimal path um, and when we can't? Um, and uh, the, the neat observation that Arjun had in his thesis is that you can use local queues as actually a very accurate proxy of remote congestion. Um, and in doing that, distribute the load only when you need to. You have a question, Greg? Yeah. Are you uh, plan planning on explaining how the routing algorithm can detect whether or not uh, a frame that it's trying to route is adversarial or not? Um, no, I'm not going to explain that. Could you? Um, <laughs> Not in the next 20 minutes. All right. Repeat the question. Uh, so the question was, um, am I going to explain how the routing algorithm knows whether the packet it's about to route is an adversarial packet or not? Um, and uh, my answer to that was no. 
And then he asked if I could, um, and I said not in the next 20 minutes. I would have to think about that a little bit longer to try to, try to explain that. Um, so here's um, the first of those points, which is basically the, the point about transient load imbalance. So this is um, from a paper we have at Supercomputing this year where we've simulated um, relatively large clone networks um, and have compared oblivious routing where we basically randomly pick the, um, in, in fact, we, and we do it in the conservative way. We're using a folded clone. We randomly pick the uh, nearest common ancestor between the source and destination, route to that common ancestor, and then route um, back down. Or we do it adaptively where we also route to the nearest common ancestor, but we pick each um, output port as we route up to the nearest common ancestor based on queue length. Um, and what you see here is that it, at low load, it doesn't matter because nobody has, you know, has queues with very many packets in them. But as you get near saturation, and this is really sort of what determines the cost-effective nature of your network is what happens out here because you've got these expensive links. You want to keep them busy all the time. We like to operate our networks at around 90 to 95% capacity. There's a big difference in latency. It can be two to one or more um, between the ob oblivious and the uh, adaptive. Um, now, one thing we found when we did adaptive allocators is some of our first adaptive allocators had horrible performance. So you know, here's the problem. You have a 64-port uh, router, 64 packets come in, and they all say, which of the 64 outputs has the smallest queue? And they all pick that one. This is what we call the greedy allocator. You see it doesn't perform very well. And the reason it doesn't perform very well is it was giving us transient load imbalance within the router, right? Everybody was picking the shortest queue, and they're making sure that he was not going to have the shortest queue on the next cycle. Um, it's not quite as bad as that because everybody doesn't arrive during the same cycle. But there's enough arrival, there was enough simultaneous bidding for that one output um, that it was causing us load imbalance. So we said the ideal thing we would like to do is build a sequential allocator. And the sequential allocator assumes it's, it's like one of these craftsmen who you get to remodel your kitchen who has this philosophy. It doesn't matter how long it takes, he's going to do it right. Um, so this, this you know, craftsman goes down port by port through your packet, uh, through your router. He goes to port one, allocates it to um, an output, updates the output queuing state, and using that updated state information, allocates port two and so on. Um, and you know, we actually found very clever ways of doing this in log time rather than linear time, but it was still a very slow procedure to have to basically um, have the semantics be as if I had updated the state in, in sequential order for every packet b bidding on an output. Is this locally or for Within one router chip. Right, you, you pick some input to start on, you would allocate that, update the output state, pick the next one, allocate that. And, and you could pick a, an arbitrary order each time. The important thing is before you made each decision, you had updated the state with the previous decision. Um, so that they weren't using stale state and all allocating the same output and overloading it. So it turns out um, you know, we, we were you know, motivated actually by some work that uh, Blodgy Prabhakar had done on, on various probabilistic algorithms and networks to say, well, what if instead of looking at all of the outputs, we just randomly picked a couple of them and you know, adaptively routed between, say, those two? Um, and it turns out this works amazingly well. Um, sequential R2 and greedy R2 are versions of the sequential and greedy algorithm where we randomly select two outputs um, of the network and then either apply greedy or sequential to them. And actually, it turns out that when you're only doing it over two, it doesn't really matter which one you do. Uh, the sequential R2 is um, slightly better than the greedy R2, but they're both um, very acceptable performance ranges. Um, and in, in the full paper, there's actually a, uh, an involved um, comparison as you go to R3 and R4, basically look at more outputs. And the greedy converges to this line, and the sequential converges to that line. But it didn't start out very far away. Yeah? Is, is the output load uh, have uh, uniformly uh, distributed output targets? This is during the adaptive route up the CLOW. So um, by definition, the, um, the offered load will accept any output port. Yeah? So uh, related to choosing two random ones, I presume that is highly tied to the sort of the ratings of the local route and things. So you make you have a decision of eight, so two is a quarter of those, and it seems to get you most. No, actually, the, the routing road. decision is made globally, and then the allocation decision is made in steps. So we actually do this across all 64 at once, picking the. So two is is almost perfect, even though you have 64. I mean, if you were doing the. the full deep thinking about it, you would go sequentially through 64 of them. Right. And so two gets you that much benefit. Yeah.
two, two gets you almost as much as looking at all 64. It was uh, a very surprising result. So um, I always wanted to know what transient load imbalance looked like. So we actually instrumented our simulator to take snapshots of what the load looked like during given cycles. And this is actually at a relatively high loading um, using oblivious routing. And that you know, phenomenon that I talked about where on average they all have the same load. Um, but you know, transiently we've got some here that are you know, holding 16 packets while the average is around two. Um, and if you use adaptive routing, um, you know, th there actually is still some transient load imbalance. We don't quite understand why that's happening. Um, but you know, most people are actually you know, at the average or just a little bit above it. Um, and and we're, you know, th this is the sort of thing that you know, is worth digging into. We'll find out you know, what's causing you know, our allocators. And this may be the, the part of the phenomena of picking two and not all 64s. It may actually occasionally send a few more. But it balances pretty well. Um, so let me uh, um, talk a little bit about uh, a network we built in collaboration with Cray Research, or not called Cray Research anymore, Cray Inc. Um, to, uh, that's going to be in, in their Black Widow supercomputer. Um, and uh, this, this is a, a network that Dennis Apps gave a talk at ISCA and, and gave a lot of details about. I'm going to give a very brief overview compared to what, what he talked about. Um, so um, let me tell you, start off by talking a little bit about Black Widow. It's a shared memory um, vector parallel computer. That means it's got a bunch of nodes, up to 32,000, um, each of which is a pretty capable vector processor. Um, you know, I forget the ex exact gigaflops ratings, but it's many tens. May even be breaking into the hundreds. Um, and um, each node can make a memory reference to the memory anywhere in the machine. So you can do loads and stores to a global address space that may land on your node or it may land on any of the 32,000 nodes. Um, and in fact, probably one of the main reasons for the vectors is to hide that memory latency. Um, they can put enough outstanding memory references out by doing a bunch of vector loads to hide the in its several thousand cycles that it takes to, to you know, read a word from the far corner of the machine. Um, the topology is a CLO, and I couldn't, you know, when I was putting this talk together hastily last night, I couldn't find a picture of the full CLO, so I've only shown the first stage of it, um, because that's all that's kind of, of, of unique. The, uh, the, the packaging unit is 32 processors. This is 32 of those vector processors. Each vector processor has um, four channels. Each channel is 18.75 gigabits per second. It's three six and a quarter links. Um, and um, those four channels basically go to four duplicate networks. So those are four completely separate clone networks. Um, each of those separate clone networks has up to three stages, and each stage um, has radix 32, and that gets you 32,000. Um, the, uh, the chip we built for this is called YARC for yet another router chip, which also happens to be Cray spelled backwards. Um, it's a 64-port uh, chip. Um, each port's three six and a quarter gig links. Um, it uses table-driven routing, but lest you think that we need a table entry per destination, the table-driven routing is really used only to map out um, um, bad links in the network. You can, you can configure the network in a very uh, conservative way around bad links. And so what it does is the tables match ranges of addresses and say that if you're routing to this range of addresses, pick this subset of the output ports when you're routing up the CLO. And then when you route down the CLO, um, you basically route based completely on your destination address. So it's adaptive routing up, um, deterministic routing down. There is a deterministic routing mode going up as well uh, because it is a cache coherent machine and certain of the cache coherent uh, protocol messages have to remain ordered. So if you're sending an ordered message, um, it uses a hash to select the upward um, um, links. And if you're not, it basically adaptively routes to select the up upward links. It's got a bunch of neat fault tolerance features. Um, in, in a supercomputer where you have 32,000 nodes, you start working out the fit rates for these nodes. And um, you know, failures happen on a pretty frequent basis, often you know, weekly, if not daily. Um, and so what you'd like to do is have a failure in the machine um, you know, ideally not even interrupt operation, but w um, if barring that, supercomputers tend to be protected with checkpoint restart, um, with checkpoints having typically on the order of about an hour. Uh, so what we'd like to do is if you can't um, you know, mask the failure, um, just roll back to the last checkpoint and have a very quick reconfiguration around it. Um, so the first thing is that you absolutely have to detect every error. You have to detect the error before it can corrupt state um, that you can't um, that you can't recover, um, and you'd like to have the rec you'd like to have it 
not corrupt state that you can't recover quickly. The, the uh, quickest restart is we use link level retry. This is a technique that we first um, used on a reliable router about 94 um, and has, has since been used on, on many routers successfully where um, on a router to router link, we check each packet as it comes in and we explicitly acknowledge each packet. Um, and you know, rather than um, asking to retransmit a, typical, a particular packet over again, this protocol actually is, is a variant of a sliding window protocol, but not end to end as it is in TCP on a link level, where we basically say, um, retransmit everything since this packet. And so once we get an error, we basically flag that point, throw everything else that comes over the link away until the start again here comes back. And the previous router basically maintains a, uh, a running history of everything that it sent that hasn't been retransmitted. It just rolls back to the beginning of that history and starts retransmitting it. Um, this works extremely well. Um, you know, these, these optical links are specced at sort of an error um, in 10 to the 15th bits. They're actually substantially better than that, depending on the power levels that they operate on. But they still make, in a large machine, they make errors on a daily basis. Um, and this very effectively masks those errors. No, no, no errors of the optical links um, squeak through this. Um, it turns out we have a monitor on the links. And if, you're, if a particular link has a retry rate um, that is higher than what you would normally expect, you can set the threshold wherever you want. Um, this is actually, you know, um, the mechanisms are all in hardware, but the policies are all in software. Um, you, you basically can degrade the link. So you can find which of the three bits of that link is the one causing the problems and you can turn that bit off. Um, so we can run the link um, three bits wide, or two bits wide, or one bit wide, or turn the whole link off. Um, and when you turn the whole link off, then that's when we update the routing table saying, don't use this link. Um, and we take advantage of the fact that there are three parallel networks and many alternatives for intermediate nodes that allow you to get to any destination without using that link. Um, so a lot, a lot of clever things um, in there. Um, the uh, implementation of the arc follows very much the subswitch. Yeah, sorry. On the previous slide, don't go back. But there's been, uh, going back 15 years, there have been uh, other router chips that did exactly the same thing with uh, um, error control on the links. There's only been one that I know of for sure, uh, which uh, gave you the same uh, kind of checking on end-to-end -end basis. In other words, if the only checking is what you described, then transient errors inside the chip and from one link to its output link are not covered. No, we cover those as well. The, the CRC is checked in the chip as well as across the link. So, so we actually, we, we do both of the things um, that, okay. so we, we both, we, we check the CRC not just, you know, from the end, from the transmitter on this router to the receiver on this router, actually the link level block on the two routers, but we also check it from the input link level block to the output link level block on a router to make sure that it hasn't become corrupted traversing the router and there's also an end-to-end -end check. Um, so it's um, you know, sort of belt and suspenders on, on, on checking the, uh, the, the packets. Um, so, so here's the, uh, the, uh, the ARC design. It follows very much um, the, um, you know, the design of the, uh, the high radix router I showed you previously, which was in the, uh, you know, the uh, John Kim's ISCA 05 paper. This is uh, a figure out of Dennis Apps' ISCA 06 paper. Um, th this, is, this is kind of a fun project because we've been doing this work on high radix routers. Cray, decided that their plans for the network for the Black Widow weren't going to work out. They needed a new network. And we said, well, why don't you guys uh, do this? And they went from uh, the first meeting to talk about it to a uh, working network in 18 months, um, which, is a, which is kind of a, a, a neat project. Um, but in any case, um, one thing which is sort of shown here, which wasn't shown in my previous block diagram, is the tiled nature of it. Instead of taking each input port and putting them all along the edge, like I had in my picture, that's kind of a nice way to draw it. It's not a nice way to build it. Um, we've divided this network into 64 tiles, and each tile has one input port. Um, the router for that input port, it's got the horizontal lines, which allow that input port to compete um, and get to any of the 8x8 eight eight subswitches in that row. It also has one of the 8x8 eight eight subswitches. So it's just a completely modular design. One 64th of the whole router is in this tile, including the input port, a subswitch, and one of the output ports. Um, one thing different between um, the, uh, the router that we simulated for our ISCO 5 paper in YARC um, is that it turns out that when we actually went to build YARC, we found we had enough wiring that we could have each um, output port or each output tile have its own link to each output um, multiplexer, these final multiplexes here, rather than having a bus they would have to compete for um, for each of them. And by doing that, what we were able to do is that when you win, remember it's sort of three decisions, compete you know, to, to uh, 
you basically um, compete among virtual channels on the input and go across a dedicated line for this input into the 8x8 switch, Complete, compete for the 8x8 switch for one of these ports. At that point, there's no competition. You're guaranteed this link to the output MUX, which in our pipeline is actually a three clock link. Um, and then the arbitration for the output port is all here. And what this did is it allowed us to make that arbitration entirely local. Otherwise, we would have had more latency for having to send a bid for that output port three clocks away, win the bid three clocks back, and then, oh, now it's time to transmit six clocks later. Um, instead, we can basically just transmit and avoid that six clock round trip um, having to deal with a global arbitration. One aspect of the design is that all of the arbitration that happens happens local to a tile. The only things that go between tiles are very heavily pipelined um, transmission of data. Um, so this is a zoom in on four tiles so you can get a closer look at one. Um, so yeah, so I think everything I have talked about, the, the routing table is really a very simple eight, eight entry cam that basically matches addresses and, and gives you a subset of output ports. Um, it's uh, 90 nanometer ASIC, um, 192 six and a quarter um, uh, gig SIRTES, which um, tops what, in, in my knowledge, is the next previous record was the uh, Velio 3003 switch that we presented at uh, Hot Chips in 2001 that had 144 four gig SIRTES um, on it. Um, this is a, a, an 80 watt chip. It turns out this was the estimate. They have them in the lab now, and it's a lot less than this. It's a usual thing that uh, all of the uh, library numbers are heavily sandbagged so that you'll never be disappointed. And it's a reasonably large die. Um, so it's nearly lunchtime. And the real reason I came here today is that Google has a really good restaurant. So not, not wanting to delay that. Um, let, let, me, let me summarize the talk. Um, so first of all, you know, why high radix? And it's really because over the last um, you know, 10 or 15 years, we've gotten this two to three, basically an order of magnitude every five year increase in the bandwidth of our router chips. And if you work the numbers, the right way to use that additional bandwidth um, is to have more skinny channels, not to have um, you know, fatter channels. Um, and you can um, sort of provision arbitrary terminal bandwidth by using channel slicing. The uh, Black Widow did four-way channel slicing. That's EGR having four ports um, into four parallel networks. Um, and then by having a high radix, you both reduce your cost, since there's fewer hops, and your latency. Um, it turns out that, that um, once you've decided high radix is the right thing to do, building a high radix router um, poses a bunch of implementation challenges, both in the allocators um, and in avoiding the head-of-line blocking problems without having to over-provision an expensive switch. Um, what we found is that using the um, um, hierarchical crossbar gives you essentially the performance of the fully buffered switch at a small fraction um, of its um, cost. And you can get around the, the problem of the non-scalable allocators at the same time by breaking this allocation decision down into a bunch of small decisions rather than doing it all in, in one big decision. Um, once you have this high radix router, um, our natural inclination, and in fact it is the way that the Black Widow is built, is to use a clone network. But it turns out that if you, if you take advantage of the ability of doing global adaptive routing, you can get um, twice the performance for a given cost as a clone network on benign traffic by building a flattened butterfly. Because the flattened butterfly allows you to have this minimal route um, when you have a benign traffic pattern or at low traffic levels where you can get away with routing minimally, taking half of the link bandwidth um, that a CLO does. You don't have to go up and down. You just go directly to the destination. And then by monitoring local queues, you can detect when um, you're in a situation where routing minimally would cause congestion. And at that point, you can then switch and treat it like a CLO network and get the performance and cost identical to a CLO on adversarial traffic patterns. So it's really the best of both worlds. Um, to route in, in that network, um, we have to do global adaptive routing that enables the use of the flattened butterfly topology. Without global adaptive routing, um, we would have you know, two choices. One is route minimally, and that would be awful. right? That, that would give us you know, um, you know, a tiny fraction of peak performance on adversarial patterns. Or route obliviously, and that would basically revert to the CLO, so there would be no advantage with the flattened butterfly. We might as well just build the CLO network. Um, global adaptive routing allows us to switch between these two modes and get the best of both worlds. And then the other thing that we just recently realized, it's the topic of our supercomputing paper this year, is this phenomena of transient load imbalance um, caused by you know, randomized routing and how adaptive routing can get rid of that and actually offer substantially lower latency, um, particularly at high loads, than, than you get out of using randomization schemes. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, the case study of YARC. It's a you know, 2.4 terabit per second router on a chip. Um, 
And actually, that, that includes the fives that can drive up to about 10 meters of cable. Um, so for you know, you know, machines where the cabinets aren't too far apart, um, it's entirely electrically connected, which is huge cost savings compared to even the least expensive uh, you know, um, XFP-type optical links. Um, and it enables um, you know, Cray to build 32K node shared memory computers where the global memory bandwidth is um, about one-tenth of the local memory bandwidth. So you can basically reference anywhere in the machine at about a tenth the bandwidth you can reference um, your local memory. So uh, I thought I'd end, end the talk with just a little bit of, a, of speculation of what, what should Google do? So you guys build big machines um, and, and do it mostly with sort of stock hardware today. You know, I, would, I would posit that by you know, you know, doing an, an aggressive design, um, you could build a much more cost effective um, and also much lower latency interconnect uh, along with higher reliability um, and you know, perhaps by putting the right shims at the interfaces, make it look just like you were plugging into stock hardware um, from the end nodes. Although, you know, if uh, um, I had the ear of the influential people around here, I certainly wouldn't stop there. I think that using stock PCs for your processing nodes is also not very cost effective, either from a dollar or a watt uh, perspective. And you could do much better um, by building you know, a, you know, multi-core processing chips with very simple processors, you know, optimized for compute per unit power. Um, and then, t then hooking those together with a very large interconnect. And uh, sort of with the resources that Google could, could bring to bear, you could build a, uh, a totally awesome comp computing platform that should be able to provide an edge in the applications that you deploy on it. So, any questions? Yeah. Um, so I have two that are probably related. So, so if the math says it, it's efficient or the right thing to do to build these high rate examples, why is it if I go out to people who build chips, I can only find 16 or 24, uh, say, 10 gigabit Ethernet chips? And sort of the follow-on that I think is actually the answer to this is when we use the word router here, or some of us use the word router here, we're thinking IP router, right? right. Layer three, three, layer four. So how, how do I do that with this? Thing. Isn't this really, if I squint at it and I think I need to do IP routing, isn't this really just a crossbar chip in some sense? It is, and that's actually, I think, why. So um, I, I apologize for using the term router in the way the interconnection network world uses it and not in the, world, the way the networking world uses it. You know, when we built the, um, the Avicii uh, TSR, we had this problem. So the, the TSR itself is a router. And the, the OBO chips we built under the switch in the, in the TSR, we refer to as the fabric router chips to, to distinguish them. These are fabric router chips. They, they don't do you know, um, you know, prefix search to do uh, you know, you know, forwarding or, or um, um, traffic management or anything like that. Um, they, they're very simple um, switches from that perspective. They're more than a, a cross point switch in that they have buffering. And, and, by, you know, and they have flow control. And so by doing the buffering and flow control correctly, they implement a fabric that does guaranteed end-to-end -end delivery of packets. With the appropriate routing algorithms, they do that in a load balanced way, choosing, pat choosing the paths in a way that do it. So it's more than just a cross point switch, it's a, but it's a building block of a fabric that collectively provides a routing function. Um, now you asked the question, gee, why, why do all the vendors um, only give you, you know, 24 port switches or whatever? And, and there's a bunch of reasons for that, many of them probably having to do with what their marketing departments are telling them um, people will buy and at what price points. But, but one of the reasons is a feasibility reason. Because um, you know, by sort of, in some sense, it's like a race car. You strip it down by taking the heating out of it and the sound insulation and all of that to get just what you need, and it will go very fast. This is a very stripped down switch. Um, in the sense that we don't need any of, of the Mac layer. We need a minimal amount of buffering because we have credit-based flow control on the links. We only need a, enough buffering to handle a round-trip latency on the links. Uh, we don't have to hold a whole packet even. Um, so these buffers are all very shallow in, in the inputs. Um, and the, the buffers um, at the, at the um, sub-switches are, are very shallow. They're all provisioned to handle a round-trip latency of the next level of flow control. And so by doing that, we can build um, a, a very lean chip that actually winds up being nearly limited by the cross-point wiring. It's not, but it's nearly limited by the cross-point wiring. And where, where you try to do a much heavier protocol, um, you wind up needing much bigger buffers, much more protocol logic, and your, your tiles would get a lot bigger, and you, and you couldn't build a 64 um, by 20 gig switch. I think, I think that's sort of the feasibility reason. Yeah, Arjun. Um, so I'm 
they can see advantages of adaptive versus indigenous. Uh, did they include the time it takes to reorder in case I want reordering? Uh, I want to break ordering the game. The, uh, the latency curves I showed did not include the reordering time. Um, I suspect, though, um, that when you look at the reordering time, you will still have an advantage because what the adaptive routing tends to do is it tends to bring packets into the same time delay um, and therefore um, will probably make the reordering take substantially less time. Right? Even though you're going to have to wait for the last you know, p you know, packet of a message to arrive before you can release a message, that, pa that, mess that packet will tend to arrive in a, in a narrower window than it would have if you were obliviously routing. Yeah. Um, so on a chip like this, can you do broadcast or how would you handle it? And then more insidiously, can, what about multicast? Multi yes, yeah, so, so the ARC does not support broadcast. It, it's strictly point to point. Um, you could do it. What, what broadcast and multicast break is a lot of the queue management. Because you know, with, with a flow controlled interconnect like this, um, what it would do is it would prevent you from, so um, think, think about I have something in an input port here, um, this input port, say, that wants to go everywhere. right? What it means is that um, before I can even arbitrate for this um, input switch, the input line, I would have to acquire a credit for every one of these buffers. right? And then I could send it. It would plop into all of those buffers. And then before it could win the switch, it would have to acquire a credit for all of the output buffers. Right? And, and so it's really that credit management um, that makes broadcast and multicast difficult. It's not difficult to do from a routing perspective or from a, uh, you know, a data transport perspective. It's difficult to do from a buffer management perspective. Because if, if one buffer blocks up, right, you then cannot advance this packet. You're, you're holding it, waiting for everything to be ready. It occurs when you can use the direct cut through thing for the benign traffic compared to the uh, longer time no. relation. No, no, no. So there, there were two separate points I made about adaptive routing. One of them w was that you, you can basically build a much lower cost network um, by taking advantage of the fact that you can you route benign traffic directly to its destination and not through a middle stage. A completely separate point is assume you have a clone network. So you have to go through a middle stage no matter what. The number of hops is going to be the same. Um, either way, for oblivious or for adaptive routing, you will get lower latency for adaptive routing because you avoid the transient load imbalance induced by oblivious routing. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, but you mean that if you use the adaptive routing, you simply are having a smarter algorithm for choosing the exit port instead of the, the, the uh, static hash. That's right. Instead of whatever you know, random scheme you have, you are using um, information about the network state to choose that output port. Whether you, whether you do it packet or flow, um, you're not using, it's an oblivious scheme if you're using hashing. You're not using information about queue, queue sizes to do it. And by using information about queue sizing, you're able to dynamically balance the load and keep the load very smooth. Okay, now, now I've got it, right? So it seems to me that, that if you have enough output ports for the oblivious hashing to choose from, right, there's got to be some critical number of output ports out of which the comparison between adaptive routing and just a simple hash would, would be nil, right? No, 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 it goes the other way. Really? The, more, uh, the more output ports you have, the larger the maximum transient load imbalance will get. It was the question I asked and that Waldemar answered, is that if you have n things picking n things, right, on average, everything gets picked once. But the worst case thing gets picked log n times. We're not going to be able to finish this, but... but but I, I, think it's an, I think it's a question that needs to be answered because uh, it would, it's important here. Let me just stop. I, I was trying to figure out exactly what the advantage was. You can ask one more. We'll explain it to you. So another question, I guess it's lunchtime. Thank you all very much for your attention.